as you were getting to know them and as you worked with them extensively, break down what you saw as like the personalities and the roles of Flipside, uh, Bus Stop and Low MB. Like what were they individually? What were they doing at the time? What was their personality and role in the group? Well, when they all came together, everybody had a specific role. Bus Stop, Bus Stop was like the, the, the reporter. He would go out and tape all of the, the different um, interviews off of Nightline with Ted Koppel, the speeches from Malcolm X, um, uh, the Watch Profits, shout out to my man, Amdi. And he would bring all of that and they would put it together with their concepts. And it was just, they had concepts. It was very conceptual. That's what I did like about it, you know? Uh, Flip was more of the people person. He's out meeting everybody. He cool with everybody. He's trying to bring everybody together. Lowe was more or less like, he had like the the, the boss kind of, Lowe and be the boss, because he had the money. He was the one putting the money up. So everybody kind of had their own, their own roles. And then when they brought it together, once Bone introduced them to me, I was just way more hip hop than everybody around me. So the scratching and the interludes and, you know, it just kind of just all came together. Right. Now, the people that know that album love it, but I think it also didn't get as much exposure, especially since in 92, rap was getting really, you know, rap just kept growing and growing and growing. So yeah. lo looking back, why do you think Straight Up Watts didn't get more attention, more exposure? It was part of a production deal, like a three act deal. So, you know, kind of with that, you have other artists and other groups that are involved in that process. So um, plus when you're in that in that situation, you have to make it grow. You have to continue to go out and meet people. You have to kind of still continue to promote and market yourself. By that time, you know, I think once once they met Quick and everything, they kind of looked at they thought they were going to be able to ride off of that a little bit more. And sometimes when you think that, it kind of stops you from still pushing yourself as far as you could be. If that makes any sense. Yeah. I mean, I don't know them, so I don't know that this applies to them, but I have seen, it sounds like you're saying, or generally speaking, I've noticed some artists when they get in, they don't realize that's when you have to work harder than ever to get. That's when you have to start to grind the relationships you make. I think with OFTB too, if knowing them behind the scenes, just, just cool dudes or whatever. But I think the persona that that's given off in rap a lot of times will scare some people away. A lot of the engineers were a little bit nervous um, when it was time to go to mastering, you know, they told, oh, it's not bumping enough, crank up the bass which messed up the mixes. You can't play it as much once the mixes aren't. And then if you're not doing clean versions, back then rappers weren't doing no clean versions. You have to just really just twist their arm to do a clean version where I'm like, if you do the clean version, it can get heard everywhere. But it took, you know, some rappers a little longer to <laughs> kind of get that. Gotcha. that good. And then with OFTB getting around, um, being around Greedy Greg, seeing Quick and these different things, what on the business side, since they had already been enjoying some success, like what did you see differently than say during the Uncle Jam Army era for you? What were you seeing that was different on the business? Um, people weren't really into the business as much. You know, they would put all of the emphasis. In, let's face it, we all came into this not knowing nothing. You see what I'm saying? And I wasn't around Uncle Jam's army that much, just only a few times or whatever. So I'm not going to even claim that, you know, we was all buddy, chummy, chummy. That wasn't what it was. But my guy, he knew Egypt real well. You know, Egypt would come over and mix at his house. You know, he would go to Egypt's house, you know, so he knew him a lot more than what I did. My parents wouldn't let me do nothing back then. I'm like Beastie Boys. You had to fight for your right to party, bro. So I'm not going to claim that I knew him that much, but through him, he would always copy everything that they did. So once, once I moved on, the average person that I ran into that was DJing, they weren't doing it on that level. They weren't handling the business. They just wanted to, they just wanted to be heard. 
but they, you know, they weren't really thinking about starting their company, getting an LLC and just really doing it right. You know, they just want the DJ. Gotcha. Okay. Well, I want to ask you about your business in a second, because next that I knew of, and when I started really uh, noticing you more was with the Coolio with the Sticky Fingers, co-producing that with Dobbs the Wino. Yes, sir. And that came in 93. And being that that was uh, what Coolio ended up being was so different from the county line, sticky fingers, mad circle yes. stuff. Yes. So I wanted you to get your perspective on sticky fingers in particular, um, looking at what Coolio was doing there, coming from the mad circle, artistically, how did you guys interact and his mindset at that time? Like, what did you hear from him? What was he saying? Like, what were you bringing to him? Coolio was dope. Coolio had rhymes. Coolio had concepts. Um, I met him through Dobbs the Wino. That was my guy. You know, we DJ together and then eventually um, started doing production together or whatever. But that was more his thing. And he would bring me in on co-production or whatever. I really didn't know Coolio was going to blow up that big. I'm going to tell you the truth. You know, when he first brought him around or whatever, I'm like, okay, that's cool. But I can honestly say I drug my feet a little bit. I could have got in a lot more, but I was already working on OFTV and I was always honing my craft, you know, because after um, being tutored by Quick and Battle Cat and Player Ham, you got to really step your game up. So it's like when you get around other people, it's kind of like they're playing with it after you've been around that kind of greatness. Yeah, I mean, the, the, that's a... Uh very potent lineup you just mentioned. Yes, sir. Which yes, sir. Uh, we'll get to a lot. Then also on Sticky Fingers, Stan the Guitar Man, who introduced us and shout out to Stan the Guitar Man as always. Uh, yeah, my guy. He's also on that record uh, doing the bass and the lead guitar for Sticky Fingers. So I wanted you to explain, uh, because rap in this era, especially like you were saying, there were sample issues, all these different things when you did have songs that had live instrumentation, what did you see that that brought or enhanced or differentiated a song? Well, at that point you could control the levels. You know, when you take a sample, you're stuck with the levels that are on there. And sometimes the part that you want to accent is surrounded by things that you don't need. You see what I'm saying? So once we got into the, the bass and the guitars or whatever, it became more defined. I've always programmed. I wasn't really a, a loop producer who would just find drum loops or whatever. Uh, I was already programming. And then once I met Quick or whatever, he was programming. And, you know, that's just, I just like the definition of it better when you can control all of the individual sounds and mix your way into, you know, the record having its own personality. Gotcha. So given that, you know, when you're coming in and, and seeing, using Quick as an example, I've been in the studio with him several times and I've seen him write raps right in front of me that they use and all this stuff. So I've seen him do so many different things that are not the same skill set. So, so for you uh, in this early 90s time, when you're getting around DJ Quick, what did you notice about him that was remarkable? I mean, he was just meticulous. I mean, he had a four track and when you hit the block, you could just hear it just banging already. And it's just, just the clarity and the definition. I mean, he was into all of the individuality, all the individual drum sounds, the programming. He was just a mad scientist. But the thing that was cool about Dave, he was share. He wasn't stingy with his information. You know, he didn't mind, uh, because he couldn't stand to listen to it if it wasn't right. So when you go over there and play it, he might, you play your stuff, he'd like your idea, but he couldn't stand to listen to it if sonically it wasn't right. So you'll just be having a conversation and he's into it and it slowly, he'll just slowly turn it down, turn it down, turn it down, turn it down. Yeah, check this out, bam, and just bang on you. And you had to take that, you know, because if he wasn't sharing the knowledge, then that would be different. You just knew you had to go and grow into it. And then at the same time, what about Player Ham? What were you picking up from him? My goodness, man. 
Player Ham was our rock him. You know what I mean? He could, he just, he just saw it vividly. This guy, once he knew what sample they wanted to use, it wasn't about the beat. These guys would write their song and have it all written out and not really worrying about. They knew they were going to get to the beat eventually. I've seen Ham. Ham was a janitor back then. And if he had a song that he was trying to get off, he would literally take his pad to work with him. And he's waxing the gym floor and scooting his pad along and writing as he worked. And he'll come home, sit his pad on that dining room table. He's like, yeah, I finished writing this while I was at work. And I mean, it just blew my mind because people were struggling with their pen in the beginning. But once you went over there, it was like, it was like an assembly line, you know, quick in the back doing the beat, ham and tweed in the front with the pen. And you were hearing whole songs. When you go elsewhere, you would hear pieces of songs. This is what I'm working on, but it would be missing a verse. This is what I'm working on. Oh, it's not mixed. When you go over there, you hear whole songs daily. That's incredible. Incredible yeah. stuff. Yes. So, so then also in 93, coming off the heels of uh, Sticky Fingers, you have uh, you have a nice plaque there behind you from Lethal Injection from Ice Cube. Yes, sir. And you did, uh, you know, two songs on there, The Cave Bitch and When I Get to Heaven. And yes, the, thing, the thing that always shocked me about that is those are two subject matter wise, <laughs> like about as far <laughs> apart as you could be. <laughs> sure, sure. So, sure. so as a producer, uh, sonically, when you saw the lyrical direction of those two tracks, how was Cube able to use what you had done musically and make such incredible songs that are so different with such different beats? Well, to tell you the truth, Cave Bitch was an accident. I had gave him a beat. Well, not me, my uh, manager gave him a beat, but it had a Millie Jackson sample in it. And he was like, nah, I don't want to clear any more samples. So that only brought me down to the when I get to heaven beat. So uh, my manager told me, he's like, man, we'll just try to make another one. So when I went to the studio, he hadn't even heard Cave Bitch yet. So Bob Morris, shout out to Bob Morris, Echo Sound. He said, go ahead and lay it. He said, if he likes it, he's going to bust to it. I said, well, you think he's going to like it? He said, oh, yeah, he'll, he'll rap to this. So we laid it. And when he came, he was so ready to get to when I get to heaven because he had a message he wanted to say. But when we banged that track, he went right in there and dropped that cave, bitch, right there on the spot. Wow. Yes, sir. And so, Bob Morris just kept looking at me, just smiling. He said, I told you. <laughs> oh, he went in. <laughs> definitely that. Definitely that. But so how I came up with it, I used America's Most Wanted acapella and programmed underneath it. And that's how I was able to come up with a vibe that I know was his kind of vibe. Didn't mean to cut you off, sir. No, it's all good. The the thing about it is when when you hear a song like Cave Bitch and the lyrics and stuff, do you ever like, man, is this gonna come out? Man, is this like too much? Man, is this does that ever cross your mind or you don't care? If you really want to know the truth, a lot of times you don't have any say so over what they're gonna put on your records, but had it gone the way I wanted it to go, I would have been New Jack Swing, uh, like Teddy Riley, you know. I was more on that clean, want everybody to be able to hear it. So the majority of everything I've ever produced, people would just cuss all over it. And I just, that wasn't what I really wanted for it. But hey, man, it's a day's work. You know, it's an opportunity to get yourself heard. And my parents, they never held it against me. They were like, hey, it's just that we know that's not your personality. That's just a day's work. So continue to grind. The right. work is come and take it, you know, but I would have loved for my work to be able to get played on the radio. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, 
The streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. A 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was, I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV basketball? Yo MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.